Well, welcome back to Emerald Hill Skies. My name's Doug, and we're located here on the outskirts of Louisville, Kentucky, where we have a Rasa telescope uh, out there in the Pure Tech 2 Observatory. This is a live view of that Rasa scope that you see here uh, beside me. And down here is a live view as well. That's kind of a view of the sky in the direction that we've got the scope pointed. It's kind of hard to get your bearings because the scope is laying over on its side as an equatorial mount. Over here in this picture is a photo of the telescope, so you can kind of get a better idea of what it looks like on its adjustable height uh, PureTech mount there. Um, you know, we're using um, a, a planetarium software, I guess you could call it, uh, to try to get our bearings at the night sky. And right now, as you can see, this is the uh, meridian. That's kind of a halfway mark that's drawn between the south. I don't know if you can make out that little S, but the south pole, and it, it just divides the Earth, it divides the celestial sphere in half. So we're a little bit west of that meridian, and we're headed over here between the constellations Corvus and Crater, actually to an object that's here in the constellation Hydra. And as we zoom in, we get closer and closer. This object is fairly low in the nighttime sky. And that red rectangle you see there is the approximate field of view of our Rasa 11-inch telescope. So that lets you see approximately what we're seeing in the nighttime sky in this picture, uh, the live video feed we're going to see in a second. And uh, trying to just check and make sure that our audio is doing okay, but um, having trouble... Um, Getting uh, a live view. Here we go. Let me check this audio real quick. But, uh, yeah, okay, so that's working. Uh, we, are, um, we are looking here at a very small object, and I think a good uh, way to get our bearings about the Herschel list, which is the target list we're working through, is to go to this book. It's actually called The Herschel 400 Observing Guide by Stephen James O'Meara, and it's divided up into different... Uh, nights that you can see. I mean, this is uh, this first night in May, and what this allows us to do is is kind of cover the nighttime sky in a very uh, sequential way. By the way, if you're tuned into the live stream, we'd love it if you would say hello and say from what part of the world you're uh, watching or listening. And the cool thing is, you'll be able to observe real time and see the very same things that we are. So now we're uh, pointing at an object called NGC 3621. That's NGC 3621. And that's a spiral galaxy. It sits about 20 million light years away. That means it takes light approximately 20 million years traveling at the speed of light, 186,000 miles per second. That's a very far object away. It's a very, very far distance. We're going to zoom in on this object and... Uh, Look at roughly what it's going to look like. It's going to look like a little spiral galaxy. Uh, actually, the picture in our planetarium software ends at that resolution right there. Uh, we don't have a great picture here. Let's go over and look at our live view now. And it uh, uh, looks like uh, Scottsdale, Arizona. Stephen Kaiser, great to have you on board. Appreciate you checking in. I bet you've got warm temperatures in Scottsdale tonight. You've probably got something in the 70s, I bet. Um, let's see, it would be 8 p.m. So I bet you're down in the 70s. We're actually not doing bad here in Louisville. I'm looking over at our Pegasus Astro Pocket Power Box uh, and Power Box Micro, and it says our temperature is 61 here in Louisville. So we're not doing bad. Stephen's got 85. So there you go. If you lived in Scottsdale, you could have 85. Hello, Scott C. from Niagara, Canada. Good to have you. So you're on the Canadian side. Super good to have you here with us tonight. Let's look at our live view. So now we're looking at a live uh, telescope view. You're actually looking through uh, this uh, Rasa telescope, and you're using this ASI 2600 MC Pro camera, and uh, you're pointed uh, toward the south. Let's get a, a view of the scope now. The little uh, live scope cam is actually looking up at the telescope as if it would view past the telescope and look at the North Pole. So because the scope is pointed over our heads in this view, you can tell that we're looking at a part of the sky 
that is pointed toward the south. And in this live view, if you look down at the bottom or kind of over to the left, you can see uh, the ladder on the side of a, of a little hook <laughs> there in the observatory. And you can see some of the red lights we have at the bottom of the observatory so we can see the uh, scope uh, lit up. And we have the night vision of this camera turned up pretty high so that we can see what's going on in the telescope when it slews to a new object. But if you look over the top of that little tree line, you can see Hydra and Corvus the crow and uh, you know some of the other uh, views in the nighttime sky. So here we go. This is uh, 9 minutes and 40 seconds of subframes, 29 different subframes, 20 seconds each, stacked on top of each other. So we're taking one picture after another. And uh, we've done a pretty decent color balance here. You can see how the peaks are lined up here at the bottom of your screen where my mouse is jumping up and down. See how those peaks are lined up. We're going to move this black level over just a little bit more into those peaks and see if we can darken our sky a little. We've got a couple of hot green pixels here, don't we? These are, these are pixels in our camera that we'll have to shoot new darks to get rid of, but let's don't pay any attention to those. Don't pay any attention to the pixels behind the curtain, whatever. Um, so here's our galaxy that we're looking at, NGC 3621. And as you look at that, we'll kind of look and see what Stephen James O'Meara says about this galaxy. He says it's a bright spiral galaxy. It's three and one fourth degree west and slightly south of, of uh, this uh, 3.5 magnitude chi, is that xi? Greek, how do you pronounce that? Boy, it's been too long since I've had Greek class. I actually took five years of Greek in college, but that was back in the, in the 70s. <laughs> I think it must be uh, Chi Hydra, Hydri. From dark sky sites, especially at southern locales, it is visible in 7x50 binoculars as a soft peach fuzz glow, even with the crescent moon up. The smallest of telescopes will show NGC 3621 as a dim, blotted haze the challenge in this star poor region is to know exactly where to look for it. So we're um, fortunate that we've got this go-to mount. It's an Ioptron uh, CEM70G, and it pointed us right at um, this uh, NGC 3621. I'm going to back off for a minute and let you see. Uh, we're going to back off these mids a little bit, get rid of that little halo of, of mids there. There's a view of the nighttime sky where we're looking uh, in the south toward Hydra. And then as we zoom in, you can see, we can zoom in on this galaxy. That's about 100%. Uh, we're going to bring up the mids now on our little um, live stacking uh, histogram down here. And that'll let us see some of the structure of this galaxy. You can see how that with our 11-inch Rasa, we're pulling in just enough at 12 minutes to be able to start seeing some of the dust lanes in this galaxy. And uh, it's not a, not a brilliant shot of the dust lanes, but there's just barely enough. I'm going to go ahead and zoom in a little bit more, even though we're going past the optical zoom of our camera now, to see if we can make out any more of the structure by looking at the digital zoom. And not a lot more we can see, just a band of dark patch there that's covering up some of these stars. You can see a brighter, a brighter part here that might be a bright star, or else maybe the, the core, the, the little bulge in the middle of this spiral galaxy, 20 million light years away. You know what I was thinking a while ago is that uh, this light that we're intercepting with our telescope mirror tonight, has traveled 20 million years in apparent age, 20 million years to get here, and nothing had stopped it. These photons had flung through the night sky for 20 million years, nothing had stopped it until, bam, it hit the mirror on the back of our 11-inch Rasa telescope, and when it hit the mirror there, the photon ended its travel. Now, isn't that zany? Our 11-inch mirror stopped some of these photons, and they will never travel again because we picked them up, and uh, what we uh, enabled our camera to do 
when it peered through this 11-inch Rasa is to be able to see this galaxy. So that's kind of a fun, uh, fun view there of a Herschel object. And this is Herschel Roman numeral 1, object number 241 in the list that's under the category of 1, the way uh, William Herschel categorized his objects. We're going to take a picture of this object tonight, and we'll save it exactly as seen. This will store it so we have a chance to, to be able to look back at it. We're also going to do uh, a, an, a, I guess you could call it a, um, an observation of this object. And we'll, um, we'll just say something like, this is a beautiful spiral um, in Hydra at a distance of 20 million light years away from our sun. Um, we could make out at 14 minutes some dust lanes that blocked the view of the uh, what would you call that, like um, nebulae, nebulous material and stars behind the dust. Now just for one more um, view here, let's go out to um, the Hubble view of this object. And uh, this is a little bit closer view, isn't it? If you're tuned into the live chat tonight, we'd encourage you to look for that chat box and go ahead and let us know where you're observing from. We've already heard from Scott in Niagara, Canada and Stephen in Scottsdale, Arizona. So these blue stars are younger probably and uh, this, uh, this particular uh, galaxy is a little bit of a unique galaxy because most of it looks fairly flat to our view. The bulge here is not so not so big of a bulge, but it is brighter. And that brightness that you see in this Hubble view is exactly what we're seeing when we come over here in this live view. Now, once again, this is the live view through our telescope. See that little bright spot there? When we come to the Hubble view, that's that little bright uh, spot there. You guys know the Hubble telescope is revolving around in orbit around the Earth, so it doesn't have to go through the clouds of the atmosphere. Um, and uh, kind of exciting to be able to see all these. And this dust lane is the dust lane that we were talking about that's maybe uh, obscuring some of those blue stars. But these blue stars are interesting because uh, we can look at these blue stars, and because we know the distance of this galaxy, we can use these blue stars to be able to calculate what are some of the distances of the extragalactic um, objects that we see out in the night sky? We use these as sort of like yardsticks because we know the distance of this galaxy. And uh, we build off one another and build our theories of distances. Of course, uh, all, of this, uh, all of these distances are sometimes theoretical. We, we learn uh, sometimes uh, five years or ten years from now that maybe we're a little bit off, but in general, the bottom line is NGC 3621 is, is about 20 million light years away. So this is what Herschel did. He tried to find the objects that were maybe um, a little bit farther, a little bit fainter, a little bit more difficult. And so you can think of this as kind of an advanced level of the, um, when we see the Messier list, you know. So we're going to, uh, take our sequencer and we're going to click it onto the program we have called Next Target. What that does is it stops the live stacking, sets the exposure to 3 seconds, sets the gain to 400, and then it uh, wraps up the sequence for us, takes care of all those things at once. Now through this, uh, this uh, ZWO ASI 2600MC Pro, we're actually looking at a live view of the night sky uh, with 3 second time exposures. Uh, let's look at our next object and and uh, head that direction. We've already done our... Oh, one more thing we have to do. We have to go up here and say, add this to the observing list called H400 Observed. And then we go back to Live Sky. We go into Edit Mode and we search for 3621 and we remove it from the list called H400 Working. Somebody asked last week, well, why do we do this? 
This way we can tell which objects we've uh, still have to observe. So this is our working list. And this kind of tells us, well, we have uh, 393 to go. <laughs> and we've observed seven. So uh, kind of gives us a big picture of where we are in the Herschel uh, 400 list. This is the uh, second video of our list. Let's get to our next object so we can make some time here. If you're listening and you'd like to tell where you're listening from, we'd love to have you check in and, and say hello from whatever town you're in. Just find that chat panel. Uh, Stephen James O'Meara tells us that in his opinion, the next thing we should go look at is NGC 4361. It's a planetary nebula. So we'll go to that next. NGC 4361. So first things first, we're going to go up here and say NGC 4361. And there's that planetary nebula. So what we're going to do now is center that in our night sky vision of our planetarium software and see where it is. And uh, that looks like a pretty good spot. Backing away from this, you can see we're inside now the um, constellation of Corvus, the crow, with this object. And so let's open up the um, info pane on this. And sure enough, there you see it. Um, it's inside Corvus, 4,000 light years from the sun. Small fuzzy disk. OK, let's kind of move that aside for a second. Now let's. Um, a slew to this from our, our position, and it's not going to move the telescope very much. You'll see the, the live view here of the telescope move just a little bit. We're still pointing toward the south part of the sky, a little bit closer to the south, a little bit farther away from west. So the scope is settling down now. We're looking at this part of the sky here. It's a live view through our ZWO uh, ASI 178 monochrome camera, which we kind of use as a digital, um, it's sort of like a digital viewfinder, you might as well say. Looks like we've got Midstap on there from Evansville, Indiana. Good to have you there, Midstap. And there's Dennis from Cloudy, Colorado. Sorry to hear about those clouds over there, Dennis. I'm sure they're coming our way. Uh, but good to have you on there from, I think, Colorado Springs. Uh, sounds like, Dennis, you grew up in Evansville. Wow. So you moved um, west. Okay, so here we are in our planetarium software. We're pointed at this part of the sky. So let's go over at our um, um, actual view through our ASI 2600, change our name to um, NGC. 4361. And that'll help us name our file correctly in a minute. We're also going to change the title to NGC 46, 4631. And this is also known as Herschel Roman numeral 165 from the Herschel 400 list. It's a planetary nebula and the constellation Corvus, Corvus Keystone, also known as the Sail. All right, so we've got our title. Let's come back now to our screen view, and uh, let's do a plate solve, and uh, we'll plate solve and resync. What this lets us do, I know if you've been on the channel before and some of you are active astronomers, when we say plate solve, it means that the mount, that is the object that the telescope tube sits on, the mount is looking at the picture through, it, through some kind of software like SharpCap, which is the imaging software we're using, looking at the picture that the camera is seeing live and comparing it to what it thought it should see by using a library of pictures we were about 1.14, uh, I'm sorry, 0.14 degrees off. So 14 hundredths of a degree off from being right, you know, tack uh, right on this object. So uh, what we'll be able to do now is we'll be able to know that when we center our frame here in sharp cap, that this object should be right there in the center. And I can kind of see the tiniest star-shaped, fuzzy speck there. It's very tiny. 
So again, we're not in the SCA objects. We're in the uh, Herschel 400, which is sort of an advanced level of the SCA. And I think this must be our object right here. Let's get our, our frame a little bit more centered. Kind of already has a little bit of color to it. This looks like a fat star there. It has a little faint fuzzy patch around it. So I think we're ready to start our sequencer on our imaging uh, run. And what that does is it sets the gain to 100, sets the exposure to 20 seconds, and then it waits for a couple of seconds, and then it resets the live stack. It starts live stacking and resets the live stack. So those steps are automated for us. And now we can close that sequence. And after the 20 seconds of information comes through, then we'll start seeing this picture of the night sky. Now, we're already zoomed in at 100%. Maybe that's our, maybe that's our planetary nebula. Man, it's not very large at all, is it? My goodness, it must be teeny tiny. Let's back our blocks off a little. Let's do another, ah, there it goes, starting to show up. Let's do another color balance. Now, what we just did there shows you the value of electronically assisted astronomy. And uh, as you guys know, electronically assisted astronomy, but if you're watching this recording maybe on uh, uh, YouTube after the fact, maybe you've never been able to look through uh, EAA before. Electronically assisted astronomy is a, is a term that describes a combination of things that are happening here. First, we're using a fairly fast optical tube assembly, fairly fast telescope, the part of the telescope that's typically called a telescope. But uh, in a, astronomy terms, you can call it the optical tube assembly because a uh, telescope kind of describes the whole thing. Uh, it's 11 inch aperture, pretty fast, f2.2, and that means by saying fast, it means that it drinks in photons and uh, translates them into electronic or digital signals pretty rapidly compared to other telescopes. Uh, sort of like a fast uh, SLR lens, a single lens reflex camera with a fast lens on it. If you had a f-stop of 2.0 on your lens, it would be, the picture would be a lot brighter in darker uh, skies, darker uh, views, wouldn't it? Be a lot brighter, faster. Compared to if you had an f-22 telephoto lens or f-10, f-16 telephoto lens, that's a darker view of the same image. It would take a lot longer exposure to see the same thing. Same thing applies electronically assisted astronomy here. We want to use as fast of an optical tube assembly as we can. Second thing we're doing is we're uh, live stacking the 20 second exposures that we're taking on top of each other. And that lets us get rid of the noise by using the algorithms that are in SharpCap. It lets us add or average the star views a little bit better than what we would be able to with our human eye because, you know, our human eye just captures what? About 30 frames a second and it never stacks them. It's always looking at one frame at a time. And um, what we're doing here is we're kind of, in a way, we're sort of gaming the system by stacking these up on top. It means that we're looking at the fainter light that we wouldn't have been able to see otherwise. Again, this is NGC 4361. This is a live view. This is not a, you know, a astrophoto. This is a live view. Let's see what Stephen James O'Meara has to say about this object. He says, NGC 4361 is one of the finest non-Messier objects of its class. He means planetary nebulae. It lies in the north central part of the Corvus Keystone. Keystone is an asterism of this Corvus the Crow constellation, also known as the sail. This keystone is almost like sail-like, uh, like in a boat, and marks the southern apex of a near right triangle with Delta Corvus and Gamma Corvi. Under a dark sky, it may be glimpsed with difficulty 
in 7 by 50 binoculars that can be seen without any trouble in a telescope. And that's what you're seeing here. Now, this object has a strange coloring. Let's go ahead and zoom in now with our digital zoom. I hope to see a little more structure here. You can see the pixelations developing because we're not bringing in any more photons here. We're just using our digital zoom to try to look at the structure of this object. And, you know, I'm kind of seeing a couple of poles here, it looks like. I don't know if those have a little bit of spiral arm shape to them, maybe almost. <laughs> But at least we're seeing a polarity. Now, you guys know what a planetary nebula is, I'm sure. I don't want to insult you. We'll put this back at 100%, which is the limit of our optical zoom. Yeah, you can definitely see those little poles, can't you? That's very unique. A planetary nebula has nothing to do with the planet at all. It's just that to early astronomers like William Herschel, maybe this fuzzy patch began to look like a planet in the nighttime sky. Let's back all the way out to see how that might have looked like a little disc-shaped planet to somebody who didn't have a telescope. If they had really good eyes, it might have looked like a planet. Anyway, they named this planet planetary, but they could also see that it had some haze around it. So the word nebula, which comes from the word cloud, it's a cloudy planet, they thought. And look in the middle. This star that appears to be in the middle of this, and there's a strong case for the fact that that is the star that's the middle of this. What happens is as this star begins to burn off most of its life, it shrinks down, and as it shrinks down, it finally kind of... Did you ever have one of those Coleman lanterns, and you have the mantle burning, the old-fashioned Coleman lantern, and you pump and pump and pump, but you're running out of fuel, and did you ever have the mantle go poof? Well, that's kind of what this star does. And it, when it goes poof, it, uh, it uh, pushes the uh, material out from the white dwarf that's left behind. And what we're looking at here is the white dwarf in the middle that has pushed out all this material. And this material travels at very high speeds out into the sky around it. I should say the, the interstellar medium around it. It's going out into interstellar space, right? And so this material, which is going out in all directions, forms a kind of a sphere around the white dwarf, and that's what we're looking at here. So with seven minutes, you can already see a lot of that haze. Let's zoom in again to our uh, digital zoom. If you're watching on the uh, chat, tell us if you think that that digital zoom is helpful. Or is that just kind of a hassle? Because this middle white dwarf, look how pixelated it looks. Because we don't have a, a, a telescope that's designed with a long focal length to be able to zoom in on this real tight. We have a telescope that has, you know, roughly a almost two degree field of view. Uh, so this object looks very small in our two degree field of view, doesn't it? So uh, tell us if that um, 4631, oh, you're right, thank you. I've got this mislabeled. In the title, we're saying 4631, but this should be 4361. Wow, that's uh, Stephen that caught that. Thank you for catching that typo. 4361. It looks like we have it named correctly in sharp cap, but that print is so fine, uh, you probably are unable to read that fine print there, but it'll help us when we name the photo. 4361. Again, this is said by Stephen James O'Meara to be one of the finest non-Messier planetary nebulae. Looks like uh, Dennis was reminding us to switch back into the live view. Thank you, Dennis, for reminding us of that. We're going to go make our observation now, and as you can see, this is the first time we have ever observed this object um, so we're going to say here, we're going to add a log entry, and look how we're um, looking at the Herschel 400 all list, and this is uh, 
session 69 at Emerald Hill Skies. This is our 69th night of observing in the last year and a half. Uh, we're on the Herschel 400 part two. We're going to say, though NGC 4361 is tiny, it is easy to discern the cloudy spherical uh, bubble around it, a bubble of cast off material. So this would be like um, dust and gases and the like. And now it's being backlit by the white dwarf. We saw distinct um, projections that we assume are traveling out from the uh, poles of this, uh, of the uh, white dwarf left in the center. Now, these projections are very interesting to me because let's see how it looks like they're sort of like spiraling out, like, like maybe this planetary nebula is spinning. And as it projected this material out in the spinning planetary nebula, these projections are sort of left behind. As the, as the nebula spins around, it pushed out that projection and it's being left out in the interstellar dust behind it. So it looks like we're getting this look of almost a spiral galaxy look, but this is not a spiral galaxy. It's very interesting. With just 10 minutes, uh, with just 10 minutes of, what would you call this, data gathering or integration, um, we could clearly see those poles. Now, let's go out. I'm going to close this. NGC 4361. Let's go over to um, our web page, the web browser that we've got open. We're going to say Hubble NGC 40, 4361, not 4631. <laughs> Thank you, Dennis. 4361. We're going to see if the Hubble has any picture of this. There's a Wikipedia entry. Mm, bummer. Looks like the Spitzer. The Spitzer Space Telescope did image this. Oh, no. Isn't that something? We're not seeing those projections on this view. Oh, it's infrared for one thing. Hmm, what do you guys make of that? Dennis says, is that also called the Lawn Sprinkler Nebula? That's a very good question. Let's go back and go to the Wikipedia entry. 4361 is a central star, extremely hot. Wolf Rayet type star. Its temperature is 270,000 Kelvin, hotter than every classical Wolf Rayet star known. It's the hottest known non-neutron star. It's nearly 18,000 times brighter than the sun, but only 6% of its size. This star is only 1,200 years old, 1,230 years. Now, in this picture, you can see maybe, but not as much as we're seeing in our Rasa. What do you make of those? Hmm. Let's do what Dennis said, and let's go back and try to see if we can find... I do remember hearing of that slang term extraordinary spiral look at this galaxy shaped planetary nebula yeah somebody else somebody else grabbed a picture of it uh, this is uh, Bill Keel thank you Bill Glowing in the red light emitted by the hydrogen atoms, the planetary nebula 4361 pictured above. The nebula itself is formed by the outer layers of grass, shrugged off by the central star visible in the image. The star's nuclear fuel almost exhausted. It's cooling and shrinking, entering the white dwarf phase of its life. The curved tendrils 
of emission reaching out from the body of the nebula have a shape reminiscent of the arms of a spiral galaxy. Huh. Let's uh, search for Lawn Sprinkler Nebula. It does not look like. That's another planetary nebula, NGC 5189. But this is a similar shape, kind of. Now that's a Hubble image. But isn't it interesting that what the Hubble saw here, we are seeing live if we zoom in using our digital zoom, and then even if we back off to just the limit of our optical zoom, if you look very closely, you can see. Now what's interesting about these um, projections is that they typically, we know uh, from looking at other planetary nebulae, these projections uh, are shooting out from the pole of the magnetic pole of this central core star. And that material shoots out, but as this planetary nebula spins, it gets left behind then in this neat little partial spiral. It's really cool. Let's save a picture of this, and we'll just save it exactly as seen. Let's see if we can brighten it up anymore. Maybe a little bit. Yeah, I think we're almost seeing. Now look at this. Now we're starting to barely see a ring of material in an outer shell that is being left by the projections, the arms, the tendrils. As they spin, it's almost beginning to resemble a kind of accretion disk, you might call it. Sort of like a disk of a spiral galaxy. And that outer ring, I don't know if you can make that out over YouTube or not. Tell me if you guys can see that. Papa Tech, welcome from Florida. Uh, sorry about the heat lightning down there. You had to bring your scope in. And no rain, but flashes of light that kills your astrophotography. Sorry about that. Popotech, can you see these um, poles that are <laughs> sort of like the spewing material that's spewing out the poles of this, and then it's being strung out in a, an outer circle that's starting to look like something like an accretion disk. This is 17 minutes, and we're gonna save this again, exactly as seen. Wow, that's, I'm just really loving what this 11-inch Rasa is doing with that object. Yep, uh, Papa Tech says he sees them almost looping back. Let's just see if Stephen James O'Meara mentions this. Nothing. I think it's because he uses, in order to do his visual astronomy, he's using a four inch telescope to write this book. Almost trying to convince you that you could see this if you had but a four inch scope. But what I'm gonna say is, man, if you've got an 11 inch scope, you can start seeing the outer regions of this cool, accretion disk looking thing here. Almost looking, looping back into itself, exactly, Papa Tech. I'm gonna save that one more time, exactly as seen. And then when that's done, saving, we'll um, go to our next target view. Uh, that's a very interesting uh, view. I wonder, did we already do, yeah, we did the we did the observation, didn't we? Did we say something about, remind me, those uh, arms? Yes. 
you said we could clearly see these poles which looked like they were um, getting let's see we could see the we could see those pole how do you say that we could clearly see that the central star which is a wolf ray at parentheses the brightest known was spewing out material in line with or I should say aligned with its own celestial poles magnetic its own magnetic poles since the planetary is apparently spinning this material appears in Papa Tech's words to quote loop back on itself making an outer disk looking formation very very interesting I'm really loving this so that's 4361 uh, what we'll do now is go up here and say add that to the observed list and then we're going to go back here in live sky and um, look for 4361 and remove it from the working list and then save the working list okay now uh, Stephen James O'Meara says the next thing we should go look at is NGC 4027 NGC 4027 looks like this is a diffuse and dim galaxy um, this galaxy is kind of warped looking so let's go find that NGC 4027 so we're going to go up here to our planetarium software and say 4027 there it is so we're going to center on it and while we do that let's back off a little bit so we can see where we go so now we're right in the middle of Corvus uh, the crow that keystone and the crater uh, constellation right above Hydra as you can see and we'll also slew to that so what that's going to do is see see this uh, see this uh, this uh, crosshairs here is our mount it's our telescope mount so again we're since I had you on the webcam we're right here between Corvus and the crater above Hydra and we're still pointing toward we're still pointing toward the west part so we're pointing toward the west part of the southern sky so that'd be south southwest I bet pretty much maybe oh yeah here's the southwest cardinal point so we're south southwest exactly I'm going to center that one more time because I kind of bumped it when I was showing you so we already slewed to it right and now we're going to um, show the info and now let's go over to our planet to our live view in um, Sharpcat and Mike Jerry good to have you aboard thanks for stopping by uh, let's uh, do our our plate solve one more time and we'll plate solve and resync here um, Mike I hope it's a nice night out there evidently in um, in Colorado Dennis has some clouds so you're there in the um, what would that be called again the not the Mojave not the the 
I want to say the Dead Sea. <laughs> like, not the Dead Sea. What is that that you're in? Salt Lake. No. Dead Lake. Dried Up Lake. Dead Death Valley. Right? The skies are a little dusty from all the wind. I think it's Death Valley that you're in, Mike. Yes, Death Valley, close to Mojave, okay. So I think this has settled down enough. We were about nine hundredths of a degree off on our plate solving. So let's go back up and draw our sequencer and start imaging. And what we're imaging here is, um, whoops, I didn't change this name. This is uh, NGC 4027, NGC 4027. And we're going to go down here in the title down here too. And we're going to say NGC 4027. This is also known as Herschel Roman numeral 2, 296. 296. And this is a small diffuse dim galaxy. A diffuse galaxy. in Corvus. Something to crow about there, huh? Now, um, we're going to uh, do our... Oh, look, we're seeing a couple of galaxies in this view. We're going to do our color balance again. Went wacko there while we do our color balance. We're going to see if we can darken the skies a little bit. And the one that we're interested in right now is right here. You can see how much noise there is in this picture. Look at how it sort of has a, a lot of confetti looking stuff. Can you guys see that confetti? Lots of noise. And that's just from the light pollution and the um, I guess mostly light pollution. <laughs> Look at how there's a little splotch out here. Let's see if we can make this sky a little bit darker. I'm going to hold down the shift key and that lets us fine tune this dark image. tricky knowing where to put those mids because my 11 inch rasa is not perfectly tuned yet. I say yet because I'm not going to give up so don't give up hope on me. Uh, as the nights get warmer, because it'll take another six hours I bet, it took six hours to get it this close. I'm going to take the first warm night, in other words it's almost warm tonight isn't it? 60 degrees out there at the observatory. So right out there in the observatory, it's 60 degrees. And the way we know that is we've got all this rig here of stuff. Not only down there in that rig rack where there's a bunch of power supplies and the box that sends the information to where I'm sitting inside the office about 200 feet away, but also we've got this equipment plate on top of the Rasa. And in the left view there, you can see how that equipment plate is kind of suspended out like an outrigger over the front of that black dew shield. And then on the right side, we zoom in on that uh, equipment that's on top of the equipment plate. You can see it's a Los Mandy equipment plate that's fastened to the top of the Rasa telescope. That little red thing there with the dew zapper band around it, that's the ASI, the ZWASI 178, that's giving us this live sky view. And then the uh, blue boxes behind it, that's the Pegasus Astro uh, power box micro on top of a Pegasus Astro USB hub. And it's just a wonderful powered 
USB hub. I can't say enough about it. If you look here on our screen, over here toward the right, are you guys able to see this where my mouse is circling? That's the software that lets you see the various um, USB ports on that Pegasus Astro USB hub. And I can actually turn them off and on here. So here's uh, port four. Let's turn it on for a moment. Now there's nothing plugged in. Nothing plugged into port four, but we did activate it just now. So I'm gonna turn port four back off again. So I love that, that we can uh, reset things, you know, we can power down things and power them back up um, remotely here using the software talking to that Pegasus Astro USB hub and it's also very bulletproof no matter how cold it gets. Some of the early hubs I tried, if you got down to like 10 degrees, they would start to malfunction. Then this software controls the Pegasus Powerbox Micro, which gives power to the various uh, functions. And you can see the voltage it's measuring coming in, 12.8 volts. Current, about 3.1 when the dew zappers are coming on. Uh, 3.0 when they're not. Sometimes it'll drop below 3 when they're not on. It tells us a temperature readout and a relative humidity of 93%, by the way. The dew point's 58 degrees, so it's calculating that, and it's using these dew... Um, it's outputting to these ports little zaps of electricity that zap the... Uh, straps, where can I show you? Um, like the strap around this red camera. Strap around this red camera here. And I don't think you can see very well, but there's a, a strap around the image on the left there. Um, there's the dew strap on the Rasa 11 inch. Are you guys seeing that? probably not seeing my mouse move, but if you look at the front of that white optical tube, you can see that band around it. So that's the equipment we're using. By the way, in this view, you can see the little screen we have back on the wall in the background. It's covered up by a little night cover, a little waterproof. It's a Gore-Tex night cover. And you can also see the rig rack at the bottom. By the way, something very interesting about that rig rack. While we're compiling frames, um, here in this, in this view, you can see there's a, on the lower level, there's a bunch of 110 receptacles, and there are also 110 receptacles in back. We're using the ones in back. On top of that, there's a 12-volt power supply, and that 12-volt power supply supplies power to this rig runner power distribution box. And that's what it is. It's not a power supply. It just distributes the power. And I thought you guys might want to see tonight the portal. It's very bright, so brace yourself for this. Uh, the portal of the rig runner. And using this web page, we're actually looking at the web server of the rig runner out there. Uh, it's the iRig uh, 4005i. The rig runner 4005i. And look how there are different nodes, and I've renamed node one the outrigger. So this is the, um, let me make sure you can go back there. Now you're seeing that screen. This first node is the amperage that's being distributed to that outrigger, that equipment plate. You can see it's receiving 313, or I'm sorry, 3.13 or 3.11, that's a real-time measurement of the amperage that's being delivered to that. And then the second node is how much is going to a USB hub we have in the um, rig, uh, the, the rack. It's a rig rack there beside the, the pier. And it's powered on, but nothing's being used because this USB hub is different than the one that's on top of the scope. This powered USB hub sends power to some USB ports that are over on that side screen so we can just set our laptop there and plug uh, USB uh, cables in. 
to be able to connect to the scope. The third node is the mount. You can see the mount's using between 0.35 and 0.37 amps as it just tracks with the nighttime sky. So I love it. We can see the overall power coming into the Rig Runner 4005i distribution box is a full 14 volts that it's receiving from the power supply. So I, I love this, and this is traveling across the fiber optic cable uh, and then out at the fiber optic box, the, that Icron uh, Raven uh, that, that's, that's translating all this information across that fiber optic cable, out there it's translated back into uh, internet signal. And I love it that we're able to use that to be able to watch what's happening inside the Rig Runner 4005i. So just kind of a fun, uh, a fun deal there. Let's go back now to our screen and look at the uh, actual galaxy that we've been imaging for nine minutes. And you can see quite a bit of material here. We'll brighten that up just a little bit and then bring the mids up a little bit. Sure enough, you can see that this is a diffuse nebula, but I kind of think something has passed by this and interacted with it. Because here you see a sort of a spiral looking arm without one on the other side of it. So I think this galaxy is being uh, interfered with by something. And is there a galaxy out here beside it? Um, Let's go over to our planetarium software for a second. And let's zoom in on this object. Again, we're looking at 4027 now. And sure enough, there is an NGC 4027A out here. And that's what our Rasa might be picking up. Uh, an NGC 4027A. There's also a PGC 37727 here. And that object that we saw in the, in the Rasa frame up here is NGC 40, 4039. I bet we're going to see that later. Yeah, we're looking at 4038. So I bet we go look at 4039 in a minute. Hmm, it's not on the list. Do you think it didn't make, 4039 might not have made the Herschel 400. So anyway, that's what we're seeing here, another little galaxy out there in the dark. Fascinating, isn't it? Let's go back to our live view. See that little galaxy just a little ways away? I bet you that's what's interacting with it and it sucked that spiral arm out, and it's spreading it across this, the interstellar space there. Almost get them in one frame. Mike, that's nice of you to encourage. I bet if we image this longer, we would see some extensions here where that little galaxy is interacting with this big one, uh, 4027. Let's go out to a web page and see if we can find something like a Hubble view of NGC 4027. The sky live dot com in the sky. There's the Wikipedia Wiki Sky ESA Hubble. So it looks like the ESA, the European Space Agency, that's way too close. Well, that's not it. That's Centaurus A. That's not what we're looking at. I think we, 4027, I think there's something wrong. So here's a paper on 4027. Here's the Wikipedia article on 4027. Yeah, in this view, you can definitely see that one hook that forms that arm out. But because they shot such a tight view, we're not seeing the neighboring 
uh, galaxy that was 4027a, it's called here. We're not seeing that, but you can see that this is distorted. And in our live view, we're seeing, let's go back to our live view one more time. Here, we're seeing that hook. So let's save, let's, let's make that sky a little bit darker, just to, I'm holding the shift key down so that this will be fine tuning, because we don't want to go crazy. Michael, is this the Michael from New Zealand? What's a nice greeting we could say that's a Kiwi greeting? Do you guys say good day? Good day. Do you guys say that over in New Zealand? Uh, anyway, I'm going to make the sky a little bit darker. Whoops, I'm going the wrong way, aren't I? Sorry. I'm going to make the sky a little bit darker in hopes that that 4027A can stand out against the contrast of the night sky. Good day, mate. All right, let's save this exactly a scene. And let's do our observation. NGC 4027 is not just a diffuse blob. It has structure. We could see a spiral arm jutting out from one side, but the other side appears to be interacting with NGC 4027A um, and is invisible, let's say all but invisible to us at 16 minutes. I don't know, if I use my imagination, I think I can start seeing some very diffuse material, but that's probably just maybe out here. Maybe. Either way, look at this structure in the center. See, I can start seeing that. Um, ring. Not fascinating. Now we're way past our camera's abilities here in the optical zoom, and we're instead um, going into the digital zoom, you might say, but it's helping us make out that ring better. I see that uh, Michael has answered and said the G'day mate is more Aussie. A New Zealander would say Kia ora, Kia ora. Sounds like you're using some kind of Spanish derivative to say, what time is it? Um, what we're going to have to do is go out here to a YouTube page and put here um, Kia Ora Pronounce, pronunciation. I wonder if I've got a way to play the desktop audio. say kia ora to somebody, it's an obvious acknowledgement to them. That is the hello for us in Māori. Kia ora. Kia ora. Kia ora. It's friendly. You've got no enemies here. It's really important to acknowledge a person. 
by using the word kia ora, we acknowledge not kia ora. just them. Kia ora. Everything about them. Where I want tattoos like he has on my face. Everyone, who they come from. Kia ora, auntie. Kia ora, kia ora, uncle. Kia ora, kia ora, kia ora. Kia ora. Kia ora. Kia ora. Kia ora. I'm saying it on behalf of my family, past and present, in the community. Welcoming you. When she gets known, the phrases vary, the context varies, but the words are still the same. Hey, kia ora, board. We have a saying, hey, itsi te kupu, nui te kōrero. Kia ora. What they're saying is... Kia ora, Michael. Kia ora, Michael. Uh, thanks for encouraging us, Michael. <laughs> yeah, I couldn't get desktop audio. I probably need to go into this OBS software and turn that on. So you would have heard it better if I'd done that. But I hoped you were hearing it through this mic that I'm using. By the way, I'm going to go back and tell you one more time. This mic that we're using is this new DJI wireless mic. And it's got this set of two wireless components so you can interview to interview somebody and then here in the middle is the receiver i really am liking these mics anyway back to astronomy oh good thanks mike for that well at uh, 19 minutes we're getting a picture of this neighbor galaxy a little better let me say this one more time and we already did observations so now we can go back over here and go um, add to observing list H400 observed, and then we're going to go back here to live sky, and we're still in edit mode, so we're going to look for 4027, and we're going to delete that from our working list, and save. Then we'll clear it out of the search box so we can see the rest of the working list there. Wow, this uh, live stream has flown by uh, for my taste. I don't know how it's been for you guys. I get really carried away in these um, objects. I know that there have been those people that have told us in the past, <laughs> that's nice of you to say, Dennis, <laughs> you never know what you'll learn during live broadcast. This is live TV. Um, uh, you know, I get kind of carried away learning about these objects. I know there are the purists who think that we should just jump three minutes at a time, but I really do get uh, kind of carried away at, at looking at these. Look at the next object we're going to go to. It is the um, 4038 now. So we're going to go to uh, NGC 4038. So let's go to that next. So to do that, we'll go back over to our planetarium software and we're going to put up here 4038. Sure enough, there it is. So we'll center on that. And that's all the farther we had to move. Now we'll slew to that. And I don't think you'll even see the scope move any. Just infinitesimally it moved. Um, now we'll open up the um, info pane and we'll have it here handy. Looks like we were here already. Does that mean 4038? Does that mean we've already been here April 15th? Non-Messier objects autofocus live stream. No, I don't think we were doing the Herschel list yet. So let's go ahead and do it since, you know, we're officially doing the Herschel list, but we do have an observation for this. Oh my goodness, that was in 2021, 415. How about this one? Um, three minutes, we could already see the bar, the antenna formation. So we did this April 15th, both years in a row. Isn't that crazy? Oh, look, it's because this was part of the Caldwell list. So this object, NGC4038, is on both the Caldwell list and the Herschel list. How about that? Okay, so we'll be ready to do that observation. Now let's go back over to here, and I don't think we have to um, plate solve. Let's just go straight to our sequencer and start imaging. 
Que hora? Que hora? Que hora, Michael? Que hora? How about that? Okay, so let's change our titles here. NGC 4038. And down here in the title bar, NGC 4038. And this is 4038 is Roman numeral 428. Why is it Roman numeral 428? Uh, and this is ring tail galaxy tail pair. Uh, the brightest member of the famous ring tail galaxy pair. So let's call it. Whoop. What did I do? Uh, part of the ring tail galaxy pair. You see, once uh, we get a warm night, we're going to tune this Rasa, and that'll help us get rid, I hope, of this halo here. Uh, we shot um, both darks. And uh, you might notice we have both darks and flats running, but in spite of that, we still have a little halo, and that's just because our uh, Rasa is so far off in its um, back focus. We, we have some back focus distortion going on, and also it's far off on its... Um, we probably have some tilt going on, but mostly I think the halo is caused by that bad back focus setting. Wow, look how bright this is. I don't think we have to do a um, white balance, but my goodness, this is incredibly bright, and that's just with two minutes. Now that's the end of um, the optical zoom on the Ross 11, but let's go ahead and zoom in a little bit digitally. and. Can you make out all this um, modeled noise here? Now, that'll go away with time if we wait long enough. I doubt if we will. We'll try to get one more object in. So we're going to dial down the... Um, boy, we don't want to dial it down too much, do we? Because that cost us some of the... being able to see some of the material here. I'm going to hold the Shift key down. That'll let me fine-tune this black level. What we really do at this point when we're messing with this histogram is we're kind of defining what is black. And once the software knows what we want to be black, then it can set all the tones in the rest of the image. Wow, that's just super interesting, isn't it? Look at that. What kind of galaxy is this? Stephen James O'Meara says, 4038, um, that this is an irregular barred spiral. I'd say. In NGC 4038 is the brightest member of the famous ringtail galaxy pair. It lies about three quarters degrees north and slightly east of 31 Craterus and is just at the verge of visibility in 7x50 binoculars from a dark sky, but that is with extreme effort. Man, I'm glad we have an 11 inch telescope because. It didn't take any effort to see this. Um, while it is somewhat bright and obvious from a dark sky, seeing the galaxy may be a challenge for small telescope users who have to deal with a bit of light pollution low in the sky. We don't have a lot of light pollution in this part. If you look here at the sky cam and you look up, look out there over those trees, there is actually some light pollution there, isn't there? But uh, I still say that at the angle we're aiming, Boy, we're not, we're kind of aiming low, comparatively speaking. Let's look at what our altitude is for this object. Position in the sky is about 19 degrees. So this is only 19 degrees above that light pollution, 19 degrees above the horizon. 
And that's what's causing all of this mottled look here. Kyoda. And also because I have the black level set pretty. Now you see we can get rid of some more of that. But that kind of introduces a weird I almost think it looks better like that. Okay, let's save this and move on, but this is a bright deal. Now if we dial back some What is the other one in the pair? 4038. NGC 4038 and 4039. I see. The antenna galaxies. Caldwell 60 and Caldwell 61 interacting galaxies going through a starburst phase in which the collision of clouds of gas and dust with entangled magnetic fields causes rapid star formation. Whew. Let's go back over to the planetarium software. Hello. Well, Starry Night Pro. There we go. Um, oh, I see. 4038 is the bright part, and 4039 is the part that looks like a cocoon. So again, going back over to our live view, this part over here on the right side is 4038, and this part is 4039. Let's do our observation of this now that we have this figured out. You guys probably already had all this, but I just am getting this. So I'm going to go here and say, add a new log entry. We finally figured out that NGC 4038 is the brighter antenna on the right side of our view and NGC 4039 is the softer, what would that look like on the left side? Almost cocoon shaped um, arm of a an interacting galaxy causing tons of star formation. Look at all the stars that are forming and we can just see them so bright in this image. That's at 175% of our optical zoom but that's incredible, isn't it? I am loving this. Well, I think we do have time to do one more object. It's 1219. So let's uh, stop our live stacking by going to our next target mode. Thank you, Mike Jerry, for helping get us started on um, sequences in SharpCap. Uh, let's add this to Oh, for some reason this wasn't in working. I think we already must have observed it and already removed it. Have we already done this? Well, it sure was interesting to look at it again. <laughs> Let's go over here to working and search for 4038. 
4039. Rats, we'd already done this one, <laughs> but it was interesting to go back to it though, wasn't it? <laughs> it was in our, uh, you know, Stephen James O'Meara book, and that's why we went to it next. <clears throat> um, what I think I'll do is uh, maybe, because I'm looking at the book now, instead of just the working list, maybe I'll take a light pencil and check the ones as we're going through this. But the next object we're supposed to look at in the Stephen James O'Meara book is NGC 3962. So I'll tell you what we'll do. The first thing we'll do is we'll look up um, NGC 3962 here and we'll look at observing lists and you see it still is in the working list. So, sorry, you can't see that. Uh, by looking at the observing list, the working list first, you see it's checked on the working list, but it's not in the observing list. So that's what we need to do. We'll get our workflow figured out here. We're going to center on NGC 3962 and also slew to it. Not a lot of telescope movement, just a little bit there. Still looking at that south, southwest part of the sky. Looks like we might have gone up a little bit. We'll open up the info pane, and this is where we find out that it has that an altitude of 21 degrees, not that much higher. And um, what are we going to look at here? NGC 3962. Wow, it's a very small and somewhat dim galaxy. You know, remember William Herschel, when he made the Herschel 400, basically the, remember that astronomy club in Florida was the one who assembled Herschel's list. Um, Whoa, look at that. I just realized we can spin. Oh my goodness, this is radical. By holding down the shift key in Starry Night Pro. I love this. We're rotating the night sky, which means we can make it look like the night sky in our field of view. So what I'm doing here is I'm holding the shift key down and spinning my control wheel on my mouse. I cannot wait to go back to the SN Starry Night Pro 8 Forum. And is there a field of view rotation in Starry Night Pro 8? Oh my goodness, the technical support people said there isn't, there isn't any. I'm going to log in and I'm going to do this right now at 1223. You guys aren't really able to see my password, are you? <laughs> Is that right? Nope. <laughs> there we go. Now I can log in here. Happy to report that during our live stream tonight, May 29th, 2022, uh, entitled Herschel List, Herschel 400 Part 2, we unintentionally discovered 
this very capability by holding down the shift key while rotating the mouse wheel if your mouse is so equipped you can rotate the night sky to match the view of your scope even if your scope doesn't what's that called have a rotator isn't it just called a rotator this will allow you this will allow us to perfectly toggle between views from SNP8 Star Night Pro 8 to the live view in SharpCat. Yay, thank you SNP8 programmers. So I know this is going to be kind of embarrassing for Kieran because he obviously answered with deep respect. I know he's a busy guy answering lots of things, but he answered without going and looking at asking the programmers. Woohoo! So well, there is a way to do it. Hallelujah. Um, four minutes left. So let's see. This is this dim little galaxy here. And we are in uh, targeting mode. So we need to switch to start imaging mode and hope against hope that this galaxy is going to show up in the three minutes we have remaining. Oh, uh, were you not able to see the Starry Night Pro window? Sorry about that, Mike. Sequences in SharpCap are great. Even better when you start using guiding, I bet. I'm sorry you guys couldn't see that, um, but you could hear me write the message at least in the SMP forum. I'm going to guess that that galaxy is right there. Right there she be. Ahoy! 3962 NGC 3962 put in sharp cap and it's going to ask if it wants us to rename the picture in a second NGC 3962 which is also known as H Roman numeral I 67 His numbering system, Herschel, Herschel's numbering system. Um, this is a small elliptical in crater constellation. Boy, I have to guess, Michael, that means goodbye. Here he ra. <laughs> We're going to go out and listen to that in just a second. <laughs> okay, back to the screen. Uh, let's make sure we're... to find our new block. What's the new block? These mids are turned up way too high. Boy, folks, there's not a lot to be seen. That is it. Look, it looks exactly like it looks exactly like Stephen James O'Meara's picture. <laughs> now go back to the uh, NGC 3962 is a very small and somewhat dim galaxy, a little more than three degrees north of five fifth magnitude eta. Crateris. Eta Crateris. 
Uh, finding it requires a decent star hop, so take your time and be patient. Your target will be but a tiny fleck of light when seen at low power, so you must be certain of your field. Well, praise God we were. Not only are we certain, but we can see the very star-shaped patterns that are here in Stephen James O'Meara's picture. Um, it's just a tiny dab of light. It's only one minute across. It just basically looks like a dim, fuzzy star. But it's an elliptical galaxy. It's... I um, wonder how far it is away. Let's see if um, we get anything from Starry Night Pro about it. Eighty million light years. That is so far. It contains an odd arc-like structure of ionized gas, which may result from an earlier merger with another galaxy. Wow. Eighty million light years away. No wonder this galaxy is but a faint fleck. Still, we could make it out in four minutes. Thank you, William Herschel. So you guys know that um, this club in Florida I think the club in Florida actually assembled 400 of the best images that Herschel had discovered. And he had discovered like 2,500. So imagine if these are, I don't think they're all the best because um, remember that, what, what is that club called at St. Augustine? Ancient Skies or something? Um, astronomy club, I think it's called. And they wanted to find a list and make a list that would be challenging for observers. So you can see why this one would be challenging. It's not that different from the stars around it. Um, so, hey, thank you for joining us for these observations. We're, we're thrilled that you were here. We're going to save this and we're also going to go over here in Starry Night Pro. And now we're going to say, add this to the list of observed objects. And here in Live Sky, we're going to say, take this away from the list in our working list. 3962. Now in our workflow, we've introduced tonight another thing we learned. We're, from now on, we're going to search in Starry Night Pro, we're going to go right click and we're going to look because fortunately Starry Night Pro lets us look and see if it's been added. You see like right now, um, it shows that it's been added to the observed list. So we won't make that mistake again like we did going back to the antennae galaxies tonight. Um, but nevertheless, that was fun going back there. The last thing we need to do is go back out here to, um, and you are seeing that, and we need to go to YouTube and search for how to pronounce H-A-E-R-E-R-A -E -E pronunciation. I just wish that I could let you hear, oh look, desktop audio. I wonder if I put that on this, if you'll be able to hear. Hmm. Desktop audio. Okay, let's try it. 
ハイレラーハイレラーハイレラーハイレラーハイレラーハイレラーハイレラーハイレラー Okay, so there you go. Let's all say ハイレラー to、uh, our last view of NGC 3962. ハイレラー to Michael down in New Zealand. And ハイレラー to you from e m e r a l d Hill Skies tonight. If you enjoy content like this, we invite you, but you don't have to. To subscribe. And if you do like content like this, we invite you to click that thumbs up, like, whatever button. And if you want to be notified when we're doing content like this, we invite you to click on the bell and that way you'll be notified.、Uh, we do live streams like this about once a week. I think we're going to try to come back again tomorrow night because I think we have back to back clear nights. So maybe we'll see you again tomorrow night, Lord willing, 11 p.m. to 1 a.m. Eastern time in North America. God bless you for coming. And speaking of that, thank you, Lord, for making these wonderful objects that you give us a look at. Thanks to the folks at、uh, Pure Tech that let us make our observatory there, and to the folks at Celestron that let us make our、uh, ROS 11, to the folks at Ioptron that let us make that SIM 70G mount, and all of you guys who were willing to observe with us tonight. Thank you for being here. I see Steven said hi da da. Mike said hi da da. You guys are awesome. Thanks for being here. It was a lot of fun. God bless and good night.